I went to Oregon because I wanted to play in the NFL. That was the leading driver to why am I going to this school? It was, okay, I've seen what they've done. It's been Akili Smith, and then it's been A.J. Feely, and then now it's Joey. I didn't know where he was going to get drafted, but I knew he was going to go high. I'm like, these guys are just spitting out quarterbacks. I went with the, with the intent of I want to play football professionally. Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of the Hey, Where'd You Go podcast. I'm Colin Kushner, and we have a very special guest. We have the Kellen Clemens. Kellen, how are you, my friend? I'm good, Colin. Thanks for having me on, bud. Absolutely, man. I appreciate you taking the time. And what's going down in Walla Walla, Washington? That's where you're located these days. And and you told me this, and according to the locals, it's the town so nice, they name it twice. They named it twice. Walla Walla. Walla Walla actually means many rivers, I found out. So we're kind of getting, you know, kind of buying in here to the community and the history. It's a quieter town. It's got obviously some really, really good wine um, and wineries from around here. But there's also hunting and fishing and stuff that I can get out. Um, Plenty of agriculture um, farmers and ranchers and stuff that make me feel like home. So um, it's been nice. We've enjoyed our time here. Speaking of home, Kellen, you're originally from the Pacific Northwest, Burns, Oregon. That's Eastern Oregon. For a guy like myself, how would you best describe where you're from? Um, gosh, see, there's just there's not a lot that's near Burns. We're about two hours east of Bend. A lot of people have driven through Burns because um, it's the only thing between Bend and if you're going over to Boise. But yeah, population, 3,500, 4,000 people, agricultural community there in Eastern Oregon, and uh, always always uh, has a soft spot for me and, my, and a place in my heart, just as my hometown. And you grew up herding cattle, if I'm not mistaken? My family has a, a, a cattle ranch, yeah. So we grew up roping and riding, haying in the summers and building fence and doing all of that stuff. It was... Uh, it was how my family made a living. Um, Dad had to work in town some, um, but uh, but that was that was how we made a living. So that was my summers. It was it was waking up and and uh, riding and pushing cows and doctoring cows and doing all of the stuff that comes with it. It was uh, it was a lot of work, um, but uh, an awesome way to grow up. One of the reasons why I was able to have the run that I had just from in my athletic career was just because I. To be honest, I just kind of outwork people, and I have I, I owe a lot of I owe that almost exclusively to the childhood that I had growing up on the ranch. We you just you worked. There was no there was no uh, well maybe or maybe not. it was just that's what is what's expected and that's what you do. And then and uh, and uh, and I carried that on into that into my football career, and it was probably it was probably the biggest uh, intangible that I had um was was I knew how to work and I wasn't afraid to to put in the hours and and do what was necessary and make the sacrifices a lot of times that are necessary. And those are long days too. I mean, I know you're getting up. Aren't you getting up at the crack of dawn? Or or, <laughs> yeah. or, or do I have it all mixed up with with movies that I've seen? I'm a Southern California surfer dude, Kellen. I have I have no clue. I'll be the first <laughs> one to tell you that. It's um you know it depends on the time of year um but uh, you know a lot of times it's by necessity too because if you're if it's September and you're pushing cows that day you want to be you want to be up early and you want to get going because you want to you want to be riding into that field at first lights while it's still cold or at least cool because when it's going to get to 100 304 in the afternoon by two o'clock you don't want to still be doing that. You don't want to be pushing through mile eight, nine, and ten in that kind of heat, and the cows don't want to either. Um, you know, and then the summer when you're haying, um, yeah, those are you, you're going and you're going hard. That was it was kind of training camp before I knew what a training camp was, <laughs> really, because you're you know you're going. We were running, we were running the Swather and the Baylor twenty four hours a day, taking shifts between my mom, my dad, and I, um, and my sisters when they got old enough to do it. Um, 
So you're just, you're going because it's all on timing and weather. If there's a rainstorm or something coming, you don't want rain on down hay. And I, I can get into all sorts of details, but um, yeah, we were going, but, but, you know, but it slows up a little bit too. And, um, you know, sometimes it's some, there, there's days where you, you're not up every day that early, um, but a lot of them. And when you're required to, you're, you're just required to, there's no, you don't call in sick. You don't, you know, there, you don't, um, you don't take days off just because you want to, you, you, you work. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I wouldn't have asked, I couldn't have asked for a better way to grow up. I really couldn't have. Cause once you're done too, then we had hundreds and, you know, sometimes thousands of acres where I would just take off on a motorcycle, on a horse, on a bicycle, or just walk. And just, I had all sorts of adventures growing up, <laughs> growing up. So how does football factor into all of this? Is that something that's that's huge in, in Eastern Oregon? What, what is the sport of choice? Football is a big deal. Um, I, I, I'm not going to say that we're like, you know, some of those, you know, Texas towns that you hear of. Um, but football is a big deal. When we would have a home playoff game or homecoming or something, I mean, you're talking about 3,500 people in town and there'd be 2,500 people at, at the game. Um it's uh, it, it was a it was a big deal, but just when you're in a smaller town like that, it is. It's hunting, it's fishing, it's work. Um, but people rally around you know the local sports teams um, because there's a there's a sense of community. I think that's oftentimes very unique to smaller towns like that. Um, you know, it's interesting. I went to I'll never forget. I went to Eugene and I'm at University of Oregon. They're like, "Where are you from?" Like, "I'm from Burns." And they go, "Oh, really? That's cool. What high school did you go to?" I'm like. The only one within a hundred miles, man. I mean, that was it. <laughs> Burns High School. We all went to the same class, you know, the same schools together, and and um, you know, there's some friendships that come out of that that are, I think, unique. Rather than some of the bigger schools where you, you know, I went to this elementary and then we switched, and you know, it's just it's 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 a different way of life in uh, in that part of the country. And the thing that I do like, kind of piggybacking off of that, you're in a small town. You have your your basically your one high school, that's where you go. I think nowadays, as I'm sure you've seen with athletes, you live in, let's just say, Los Angeles. You can go, you could shop yourself around to all these other schools instead of just putting on the jersey of the one that you're zoned for and doing the best job that you can. Yeah, yeah, and it, and that's the way that it was. I mean, you knew, there was no question. I, I have vivid memories of going to high school football games when I was in third, fourth, fifth grade, and you're watching, you know, it's kind of, it's a little bit of both because our, our football field is in right and center field of the high school baseball. So, you know, you have some extra grass over there, left field where there was a tackle football game going on, you know, for the fifth and sixth graders too. Um, but I remember vividly watching, and I mean, you know, it's not a question of what high school am I going to. I mean, those guys that are out there on Friday nights are, I mean, those are our heroes. And I can still name the starting roster from some of those teams of just guys that I watched. And then we would be those guys on Monday at recess. I mean, I'm Kevin Walker and I'm uh, Tyson Trammell and I'm so, and you just go through, I'm John Dahl. I mean, guys that I don't know what they're doing now, but I can still remember their names because those were my heroes. And then we would play it and, and, and you just, that's the way that it, it just kind of manifests itself year after year. And then now soon I was one of those guys who was out there playing and there's new third and fourth grade kids that are over there playing the same game that we were always playing before. It's just, it's, it's, I, you should come back, come back sometime, Colin. I'll take you to Highlander football game. It's uh it's small town America at its finest. I'm in. You, you don't have to twist my arm to do that. I mean, I got a little slice of that during my time in rural Louisiana and I loved it. It's just it puts it puts things weirdly into perspective because to, to see the passion behind that town and everyone empties out, people are on their trucks, they're barbecuing, they're they're grilling up plates of food saying, hey, do you want some of this? You know, all for a football game. But it's amazing, dude. You can't put a price on that. My grandpa parked in the same play. He watched the game from his pickup because there's a hill that kind of over. He watched every game from the same exact place and he would park on wednesday night to make sure he got his spot grandma would pick him up and then he'd catch a ride into town with somebody he'd sit there i knew what truck he was in if we scored in that end zone 
Um, and uh, and then, you know, he'd take off and go afterwards. Sometimes if you still sitting there and we leave, you get to run up and say hi. But there's just – there's little parts like that that never – Never change, and uh, and it is. It's it's special. What attracted you to football to begin with? Was it something that you, your dad enjoyed? Uh, you know, a grandparent. Like, what attracted you to the sport? So, growing up in Burns, I mean, you play everything, right? We had you just we graduated with sixty kids. So, if you figure thirty of them are boys, not all of them are playing sports. So you just you just play everything. I played baseball. I played basketball. I played football. We just you just played basketball is actually my first love. My goal, if you'd asked me as a fifth grader, was I want to go to the NBA. But since this is a video call, you can see at 6'2", that wasn't really in the cards. Um, can barely jump. Marginal 15-footer. That was about <laughs> it. Just get me to the foul line, and uh, I'll try to get a cheap one. Um, but my dad actually played college football at Portland State. He played defensive back. So, and he played quarterback in high school. Um, and so, I mean, we would always, we would always be out. We'd always be playing football. We'd always be doing whatever. Well, at some point it kind of, I mean, I pitched in baseball, but I wasn't, it's not like I was any good. Um, and, but at some point it kind of started to click a little bit where it's like, he can kind of throw it a little bit. So my freshman year, I played JV suited up for varsity we we're running a wing t calling so i mean like i mean 616 quarterback trap some stuff i mean we're not we're throwing it like five times a game maybe <laughs> winning but we're not throwing it very much and i'm not built to run um so i would come in and throw if we got down or whatever i ended up i ended up lettering i played in like seven or eight games but it wasn't anything i didn't light it on fire in my High school coach, who's still the high school coach there, his name's Terry, Terry Graham. You want to talk about small town America, high school football coach. The man is an absolute legend. Um, and uh, he switched. He was from Oklahoma. I mean, he was like, we run the football. This is what we do. We throw it. He's, you know, I mean, there's two, there's the school thought, right? That if you throw the ball, there's only three things that can happen and two of them are bad. That was, I mean, that was kind of where he was coming from. And uh, and he scrapped everything going into my sophomore year, and we went to run and shoot. We were watching Mouse Davis, Neil Lomax tapes. We were doing all sorts of stuff, and we went from pack it all in and ground, you know, ground and pound to spread it out and throwing it 30, 40 times a game, and it was incredible. For three summers in a row, I got on a Greyhound bus in Burns, Oregon. They actually, mom and dad had to drive me to Bend, actually, because we didn't have a bus stop in Burns at the time. But I got on a Greyhound bus and rode to Portland, and I would stay for a week with my dad's college roommate, and I would do summer football camps with a guy named Greg Barton. Greg would just work me out, and because I was, because I'd shown the dedication and I couldn't afford it anyway, Greg just took me on. Greg played for the Lions. I would do that, and then and then I would come home, and we would just we just work, and I would go, and I would work. Man, I was dragging. You're talking about ranch kid. I had an old tire that I just drug behind me, and I'd just run through the field and run hills, and just kind of figure it out. And at some point, it just kind of it just clicked. But I, you know, I I don't end up where I'm at if my high school coach doesn't have the vision to do that to make the change. Because I'm a shoot. I don't even know if I'd play. I can't run. Um, and uh, and then I, you know, I had some, I had some guys around me that were really good athletes. We had a good class, class above me and below me was in, in small town America. Calling if you got seven, eight, nine good athletes between a few group of, you can do some stuff. And we had it. Um, and uh, yeah, so it kind of just took off from there. I started getting some letters after my sophomore year and kind of just stumbled into it. When you started getting offers. What was what was your mindset? What was going through your head? Like, oh my God! Like, this is you know. Did things start to kind of take shape from there for you? So this is like pre-internet. I mean, we're going back in time here. So this is I was making VHS copies of you know of games and oh my gosh, what a process! This was way before Huddle and all the technology nowadays. I got a few letters after my sophomore year. I mean, I had a good year. We went to the second round of the playoffs. My junior year. We went to the state championship, but I still wasn't really getting that much, to be honest. I, so I made I made a highlight tape, 
um, which was just, I mean, it's, I, I can only, the footage is ridiculous. And then, and then I, you know, you just kind of pick your best game. That was what we did back then. You know, and then I had to make copies of those, like, you know, hook two VCRs up, put one in, push play, put blank one in the other one and record. My kids got no idea what we did. Um, and so I sent that out to everybody in the Pac-10. It was the Pac-10 at the time. And within, I, mean, I was largely kind of still a nobody. I mean, I'm in Burns, there's no internet. I don't know, a couple of weeks, I had five or six offers from Pac-10 schools. They were like, where's this guy hiding? That year, it was it was me, Derek Anderson, and a guy named Nick Costa, who were all ranked in the top 10 in the country, and we're all in-state guys. It was like, it was a pretty good year for Oregon quarterback, high school quarterbacks. We all kind of had our eye on Oregon um and uh because they were coming off of a holiday bowl win getting ready to go was, harrington was going to be a heisman finalist whatever anyway um so oregon held out until they were the last they were the last ones to offer and when they offered i took it and that first time that you stepped foot on campus at eugene you got to step foot in, inside Autzen stadium what's going through your head first time that i stepped on campus uh, was, you know, it was like, what, what have I done? I am a fish out of water. I am, what is, what is even happening here? The guys were so big. I went over for summer workouts just for a week and the guys were so big and the offense was so complex and everything was moving so fast. And I mean, they were, I mean, they were grown men. I mean, just, it was, I was scared. And I think I'm pretty sure I went home and I was like, mom, I, I don't, I don't, I think I made a mistake. I think I just want to stay <laughs> on the farm and just be here where it's safe and, uh, and be good. But I ended up going back. Well, you take that hard work mentality and of course, anything like that's going to be a shock. I mean, you know, especially when you're going from, from a small town, you're going to a place like Eugene giant campus and the football players. And it's not like you're a small guy either. I'm, I'm a generous five ten. I consider that to be short. You're six two, dude. You're still you're still right up there. I was I mean I was up there, but it was just it's just you know, I mean it's just different. It's just um they were they were grown men with a lot of attitude and you know, summer workouts. Guys it was it was cool. It was a fun it was a fun week, but it was uh it was definitely different than what I had seen growing up. You're just seeing guys in a whole different light. Um just because now you're seeing some of the work ethic that you're seeing some of the work ethic and some of the guys that aren't working, which was interesting because growing up I and mean, we just, we all worked together. I mean, it was what we did. We didn't have a choice, but um, you just, you saw, you saw both sides of it. You saw guys that had the ego. You saw guys that were super humble and really nice guys. Um, you saw, you saw everything in between. It was just, it was just an eye opening experience. And Eugene isn't even that big. I mean, it's not, I mean, it's not like I went to UCLA or, or even UW and went up to Seattle. I mean, Eugene's not a big town, but it was still it was still big for a guy from Burns. What was your game plan once you once you got on campus? You finally got settled in. What was your game your game plan from a football point of view and then academically? Gosh, that's a great question, um, and I didn't have one, which was a detriment. Um, I I had one academically which I knew, you know, I, I had the ag background, but would have made more sense to do an Oregon state or a Washington state or an Arizona state. Um, uh, with that, uh, with that, you know, in mind, if I was going to try to pursue something like that, but so I knew, you know, so I, I went business, um, administration. That was, I picked that early and knew what I was going to do and, and follow through with that and, um, and got marginal grades <laughs> along the process from a football standpoint. I didn't know. Colin, it was one of the great mistakes that I made, um, the first of many probably, but I didn't have a plan. Okay, how am I going to attack this? I mean, I'm looking at a playbook that's three and a half inches thick. How am I going to attack this? How am I going to figure this out? And so I just I just opened to the first page and I just started reading. And it was the worst thing I could have done um, because, you know, everything, everything – builds off of one another and it doesn't necessarily start with the run game and, and d -d 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 by the section. So um, I didn't have a plan. I should have, I should have talked to somebody 
that was older than me. I should have asked more questions, but I didn't. And it set me back. So my first year, Joey's playing, um, and he's a Heisman Trophy candidate, and we went 11-1 and one and finished number two. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. And then my second year, I'm going to compete, but I wasn't ready, and largely because I just wasn't ready. I hadn't – I had worked really hard, but I hadn't worked smart. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so I wasn't ready. Um, a guy named Jason Fife won on the job. By my third year, I was like, okay, hold on. Let's figure this out. And then it, and then it clicked and I started to be able to play. Because if, you if you're thinking too much, especially playing quarterback, and I'm sure maybe hockey was the same way. If you're, if you're thinking too much, you're not playing like you should. Yeah, I mean, it takes, you, it takes you out of the task at hand, which is just kind of taking a deep breath and, and getting into game mode. But to play devil's advocate – and and I and the reason why I'm bringing this up is because when you're 18 years old, I would say 97% of us have no clue what we're doing. I mean, when I went to school, I I feel like I was the anomaly. I knew I wanted to be in broadcast journalism. Like I I knew like I knew that's what I wanted to do. But there were tons of other friends and friends I'm still close with today that I had no clue. And it they took that time to figure out life academically or athletically. A state school would have made some more sense but I went to Oregon because I wanted to play in the NFL that was that was the leading driver to why am I going to this school it was okay I've seen what they've done it's been Akili Smith and then it's been AJ Feely and then now it's Joey I didn't know where he was going to get drafted but I knew he was going to go high I'm like these guys are just spitting out quarterbacks Jeff Tedford was the offensive coordinator at the time he left after my first year um but I was like, you know, he was the probably the main reason why I went there is because of the conversations that I was having with him, you know, during the recruiting process. So I, I went with the with the intent of I want to play football professionally. I got good grades. I applied myself pretty good. And I still just got good grades. They weren't great. Um, but yeah, it was it was you know even as an eighteen year old kid, I knew. I knew why I was there. I just didn't understand the process um, to to really go beyond um, to be efficient. I guess with the time that I had and that I was working, so I worked hard. I just didn't, like I said, I didn't work very smart. When you finally did get start getting playing time, because you said like the goal of going to Oregon, I want to play in the NFL, and things started clicking. But I didn't really assume the reins until we were at UCLA. Um, and they just never pulled me. They just kind of like, you're going back in, you're going back in, you're going back in. And it was, it was really good for me because I just, I just played. If I got too uptight, then it wasn't always a good thing. Um, and then my junior year was my show, and we went five and six. First time Oregon missed a bowl in like eleven years, um, and uh, that one was tough. That was a tough year. We had some injuries. I didn't play well in a couple games. Lost to Indiana at home. Oh, the highly regarded Hoosiers. Highly regarded Hoosiers. Yeah, I came into odds and I threw, I think, at least two picks. I didn't play really well. Um, my senior year, we switched offenses. We brought in a guy named Gary Croton, who was just kind of like the mad scientist. Um, I'm still close with him today. He's just incredibly innovative. And we were doing some of the read option stuff as we first started. People forget before Mariota at Oregon, before he was doing all that read option stuff, there was somebody else that was at Oregon that was doing all that read option stuff and really fast and running around. That's Dennis Dixon, also a good player. I was before Dennis. I was, was kind of like the, the not fast version. But anyway, um, so we started doing that, and it was it was fantastic. It was we lost to SC, but other than that, I think we were ranked in the top 10. Um, and uh, and they were starting to kind of – there was a little bit of buzz about me maybe getting a, you know on the, on the Heisman ballot. We go down to Arizona, and I broke my leg. And it was done. And it was just like that. I mean, it was, it was probably the funnest that I'd had playing. Everything was clicking. It was good. Defense was playing good. And, uh, yeah, I went over there and got horse collared and, uh, my left ankle just exploded. Am I done? What am I doing? What am I, what am I doing? It kind of makes you, 
it kind of makes you step back a little bit. But I had gotten married that summer before. I got married before my senior year. Um, and uh, and so having my wife there with me was huge um, just to be a steady, steadying force and kind of keep it in perspective and kind of smack me upside the head a little bit if I started moping around and pouting and saying, why me? Um, so that was that was huge. Her being uh, there and with me for that time um was was crucial because i was a little bit i was a little down when you're having fun things tend to go extremely well and then all of a sudden you get the horse collar you get injured i mean and then it's just like you said in your mind all these thoughts start kind of coming in like what's gonna happen next like and all the, and most of it's just crazy yeah because i got invited to the combine but i couldn't run I did throw, but that's, I mean, you were talking about a meat market. That place is terrible. You know, you go in there with an ankle that I've just been walking on and kind of starting to run on for the last four or five weeks, I think. It wasn't that long. And you have 32 team doctors take that and rip it and wrench and try to just make sure, you know, it was the worst. Oh, gosh, you're trying to just keep the swelling down just so that you can go through, like, the drills right. and do kind of stuff and not limp into the meetings with the teams. <laughs> and then you have to do that on medical day, and it's just like, oh, my gosh. And they all speak into their little recorders, and but but they don't – like, you're still right here. And there's, like, well, he, you know, <laughs> significant atrophy in his left quadricep. Da, 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 Using all these words that I'm like, I don't even know what that means, but it doesn't sound good, and you're not smiling. So you're like, you I just, can hear you. <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. I'm right here. Um, but yeah, that was, that was a that was an interesting few days in Indianapolis for the combine, and you know, you just don't know. But that that kind of it was similar actually to my recruiting bit. I fell off the radar after I got hurt. I mean, you know, you just you're not mentioning it. You know, Davey O'Brien, all that stuff. You're gone, and um, and. After I went to the combine because I, I knew protections and I knew run games and I could I was changing stuff with the line of scrimmage in college so I could get on the board and show these teams kind of what I knew. Then I started to come back a little bit and um, um, and get you know a little bit more momentum going into the draft. The New York Jets grab you in the second round. What was that moment like for you, especially after going to Oregon specifically? with the goal to play in the NFL? We didn't have TV growing up, right? We didn't have TV at my house, which was by choice, and I don't regret it. I There are days where I wish we didn't have it in our home either. But So we go up to my grandma and grandpa's, closest neighbor. They live a half mile up the field, okay? So we're up there. because grandma and grandpa have it. We're watching. So I watched the first uh, Halotinata went somewhere in the top 15. He might have went eighth. He went to Baltimore. Anyway, I watched because I knew he was going to go early. And then, you know, I don't know, stress, whatever. It was just there was a lot going on. So I went into one of the back bedrooms and I went to sleep. I woke up to my agent calling. I mean, I didn't know. I was projected maybe in the second, could be third, could be fourth. Um, and, uh, I mean, could have even been fifth. I didn't know. So I woke up to my agent calling. I'm like, ah. Okay, hi. Did we kind of talk for me? He's like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "I'm sleeping." And I get another call. I'm like, "It's a it's a New York number." He goes, "You need to take that. Goodbye." Click. And so, and then I was tan and bomb from the Jets. Hey, are you healthy? You good? Yeah. All right, we're about to pick you. So I went walking out in the living room. Everybody was sitting there. My folks, my wife's parents, you know, some aunts and uncles and different people, and and uh, and that was it. It was crazy. My wife's sister was getting married the next week. And I was I was not in the wedding, which I'm sure they regret now, but I would <laughs> uh, they were getting married. And, you know, then it's like you get the call from Tannenbaum. You talk to Mangini, a couple of the people call. Da, da, da. It's like, where are you? How soon can you get to an airport? You're getting on a red eye boom, flying out. So I missed their wedding. It was just it, it was just it was a blur. I got on a red eye flight from Seattle to New York, landed, go straight to get another physical to make sure that you're okay. And then I was on the field that afternoon for rookie minicamp. I mean, it's crazy. This is pre, you know, 2011, pre-CBA stuff. It was nuts. I was I was terrible, Colin. I was terrible. I mean, couldn't, I mean, couldn't throw a spiral. They were probably going, what did we just draft? 
this guy. Well, then that's when you tell them I just woke up from my nap. <laughs> I just woke up. You guys keep waking me up. I slept on the plane. I was sleeping in the thing. It was, yeah, it was nuts. But we got done. You know, it was cool. It was a, it was a, I, you know, I get the call. I watched my name get called by, you know, Roger Goodell. Man, that was cool with the 49th pick, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's, that's a, it's a culmination of years and years and years of hard work and sacrifice. And, um, you know, and then it was just kind of like, all right, now what? Now we got to get to work. I've gone from Burns to Eugene, which was a heck of a transition. And now I'm going to New York City. I don't know anything about what's there. I don't, you know, I just know it sounds like a really big place. Um, and uh, so my wife and I actually, my my wife and I got horseback and just went for a ride. We just went for a ride for about two hours and just left our phones and just kind of shut it out, talked, tried to answer some of her questions, even though I was just as clueless about what was coming as she was. Um, and, uh, but it was, uh, I still remember that. I still remember that, that ride and where we went, we just kind of, we just visited and tried to figure out. I mean, I was 22 and we had no idea. You have no idea. You wake up and yeah, it's a lot. You wake up that morning and it's like, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm probably going to have a job by the end of the day in one of 32 cities and I have no idea and I have no control. I've never even thought about it like that. That's a lot of, uh, that would give me a ton of anxiety, especially especially when you've lived in the Pacific Northwest your entire life, to think that now the map is open. You could end up in Detroit, God forbid you end up there. Um, you know, or <laughs> I only rip on Detroit, by the way, because my entire family is from there. So there's, they know it's all in good fun, but that's a, that, that, that's a lot. Well, and, and, you know, I mean, I was right on the, I was, that was back when the draft was, one, two, three, rounds one, two, three on day one, and then four, five, six, seven, I think. Yeah, four, five, six, seven on day two. It was only a two-day draft. Or it was either just one and two on day one and then three through seven. I can't remember. But, you know, you wake up, it's like, I might know, but I wasn't guaranteed to go in one of those first three rounds, so I might be going to sleep tonight going, I still don't know. And you had a ton of success, Kellen, in the NFL. You played 12 seasons. Throughout your entire career and, and each of the teams you played for, who was somebody that you looked up to and and influenced you? Oh man. There's there's three answers that I'll give you. So first of all, so Chad Pennington was the guy. He was the man in New York when I get drafted. Um and for a guy who was drafted, I mean, middle of the second round, I'm there for a reason. They're drafting me, you know, for kind of the long term. Chad was the consummate professional, great Christian man, um, great family man, great example for me of how to be a husband and a father and balance that workload. I I don't make it 12 years if Chad Pennington doesn't have the effect on me that he had on me as a first and second year player. I can say that without any hesitation. He was, you know, and we... There was never really tension because Chad's too much of a pro for there to be any tension, but we became really pretty good friends by the end of it, um, by the end of his run there. And I still, I still call him to check in and just how the, you know, how's Robin and the boys and, and, and just visit. But he became a role model and a very big influence in me, uh, for me and my career very early, just, just because of who he is how he conducted himself. I'll never forget it. Eric Mangini came into a meeting. I was a rookie and he was talking about preparation. He was talking about different things, you know, just take care of your body, whatever. And, he's, and he pointed out Chad specifically. And he's like, like Chad Pennington, you would say is a pro. And that's like the ultimate compliment that you can get. If somebody's like, that guy's a pro that, I mean, whether they can, run fast, throw far, tackle, whatever. Like if somebody says, Hey, that guy's a pro that means that's, that's a, that's a gold star. And, um, and I remember hearing it and going, I, I, I want to get to that level. At some point I want somebody to look at me and be like, that guy's a pro. The reason why Chad left is because some guy named Brett Favre, <laughs> we traded for Brett Favre. I modeled my game after Brett Favre. I thought of myself as Brett Favre, Favre when I was playing high school football. I mean, it was, I, it was, I'm like, this guy's walking on water. There were two things with Brett. First of all, he was, it was, it was literally my hero walked to the door. 
We're at Cleveland. I guess I still remember it. We're in the locker room. And he just walks in, street clothes. I was like, oh, my gosh. He came over. He talked to me. I was like, this is – anyway. So he did that. But he was also – it was a very um, – it was a really competitive, really um, high-stress environment. And I had, it by that point in my career, kind of lost my passion for football. And <laughs> – Anybody that's seen Brett Favre play knows that the dude just exhibits or exudes passion. I mean, he just he just played because he loved the game, and it and being able to watch him and be a small part of that from a distance really probably saved my career for another way. Actually, I probably should give him more credit than than what um, than what I originally did because without that, I burn out in another couple of years. Because I'm just, I'd lost the reason why I play the game. Um, and and he he kind of reignited that fire for me. Um, so those those two when I was in New York. And then um, Philip Rivers in San Diego uh, slash one year of L.A. Because Philip, um, you know, I'm in a different place in my career by the time I get to be Philip with Philip. That was years 9 10 11 and 12 and i talked to him a couple times because we played you know whatever i knew he was also you know i knew he's also catholic and he lived his faith there's all the articles and in and, and interviews and stuff of him um but you don't really know him i mean i've seen philip on tv and he's yelling and he's talking trash and he's doing this. I'm like, Who is this guy? and um and but the impact that philip had on me and my life probably less on the field and more off um, just from a spirituality standpoint. I mean, obviously a great husband and father. Um, but I mean, we would, we lived in the same neighborhood. So we would carpool together, go to work. Um, I mean, we we're saying the rosary to work on the way to work in the mornings, um, go to church together. Kids played football, basketball together, ran track, I guess if you could count. I mean, we did a lot of things just together our families thanksgivings um and uh so he i mean shoot he's my youngest daughter's godfather he and his wife um so you know he had a a a significant impact on me off the field um but those would be the three those would be the three where i look back on i'm like i was i was fortunate to play with those with those people and it seems like each of them impacted you in their in their own way. You know, Brett Favre, like you said, reigniting you for the passion of the game of football. You know, Philip Rivers, more spirituality, and obviously Chad Pennington. You just said was was the ultimate pro. Chad set the standard in you know the direction. It's kind of like when I talked about you know I'm a freshman at Oregon and I don't I don't even know what I don't know. Chad, I'm a you know I'm a rookie in New York and I. Once again, I don't know what I don't know. And Chad was the one that like reached over and was like, hey, this is where you want to go. And this is how you do it. And, you know, kind of like and um, and so the growth, I think, was much faster in New York because I had that example. And I mean, I literally I just got in his shadow and was like, I'm going to do what you do. But I pro- I, I'm sure that I annoyed the heck out of him at one point or another probably once a week, um, but he never showed it. And Chad, Chad gave me some of the best advice that I've ever gotten. And it's one of the things that I, I always share. It's a story I always share with young people because I think that we've lost sight of this. But Chad pulled me aside one day. I can't remember the circumstances. And he said, look, this is what you do. It's not who you are. So this, you know, this sport, when you're talking about identity, this is what you do. It's not who you are. And I think that, you know, now is that I've, I'm done playing and I'm out of that, um, as inevitably happens to everybody. If we could all hear that early in our career, I think it would make a significant difference. And I always say it every chance I get. So what you just said is so important for an athlete and, and for just somebody in business or just in the professional world, because a prime example, Kellen, I was a sports anchor reporter for six years, but I was so wrapped up into it where I made it, that was me. And once I stepped away from that and got the great opportunity over at Yahoo to kind of veer away from what I was doing before, I had a really difficult time because I just thought, 
well, I'm not the sports anchor anymore, so then now what? Who am I? Uh, it's a, it's it's an identity it's an identity challenge and it's it's so much easier said than done i i mean i i had that great and i'm not i haven't been perfect on it because um you know it's it's what we it, it is what we do and we do a lot of it you know and and you you can get into some trouble when you start viewing yourself through the same lens that other people view you because that's all that they see um and uh and if that's the only way that you start to see yourself it's a it's a scary road because that, as we've seen, I mean, every athlete at some point their career ends. Um, you know, I mean, we've seen that with COVID, with the amount of layoffs and different things. At some point, it likely ends or it changes or it does whatever. Or maybe it all goes just perfect and you get to age 55, 60 and you retire. And then what? Now, who am I? The question will always be there. It never you you, you can't. You can't evade it, man. It's like uh, it's like Troy Polamalu coming after you. He's he's gonna get you at some point. <laughs> going to get you for sure. It's whether or not it surprises you, or you see it coming, or you you know whatever. But at some point, you know it's we, what you did is hopefully what you did or what you do is not who you are. And the greatest thing is we get to choose. We get to choose who we are. But it's easier said than done. Yeah, well, that, that's the best possible advice. And see, I always thought that was something that only applied to athletes. I thought, oh, it, it only applies to athletes. And then all of a sudden, I realized, no, this is affecting me, you know, in, in the business professional world. If, if you would have asked me if I ever thought that could have happened, I would have said, no way. No shot. <laughs> I would have put money down. And I'm not a gambling man by any means. But you would have put money down. Felt good about it. It's, it's it's interesting that you you expand the lens to um, it is it applies to all of us and you know it's it's, it's you know it's, I mean shoot people who are it's I'm just now I'm just spitfiring Colin this is scary but like even the people that become empty nesters and it's like okay now what now what my identity has been wrapped up in these two three four kids whatever it is now what. Now who am I if I'm not mom or dad or whatever? And you still are, but you don't have – that's not what you're doing as much anymore. It changes. I don't know. When your football career winded down in 2017, then 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 what? Then what happened? What was going through your mind? How did you start to make that, that transition away from the game that you had dedicated your entire life to? The transition for every athlete is different. Um, mine was um, – Mine was a process and it took a couple years. So for, so for 2018, like I don't sit still. The fact that I'm still sitting in this chair is really quite remarkable. I don't, I just, I don't sit still. I, I don't do it. I don't like to do it. And there, but there'd been so much, you know, I mean, why my wife and I, when we got done playing the Chargers call, Hey, we're not bringing you back. Totally get it. Appreciate it. Thanks for everything. Um, you know, and, and there was, there were no other phone calls coming in. This is when free agency started. It was like, all right, we're not going to be on a team this spring. That's fine. So I stayed in shape and kept throwing for that fall. Um, and I just, we moved back to Walla Walla because we owned the house here. Um, put the, we didn't put the kids in school. We homeschooled. And I was kind of trying to figure out what I was doing, but I was kind of, my wife was like, you need to just take a few months and just chill out, which was, the, which was great in theory. I, I couldn't do it. I, I couldn't do it. And I got a few calls. I went down to San Francisco when Garoppolo got hurt. Um, and then when Alex Smith actually had his horrific injury, I get a call. We do a few drills, throw a few balls, and they're like, all right, good. Hey, uh, we're going with Sanchez. Um, stay ready because if he doesn't pass his physical, then we're going to sign you. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, whatever. Sanchez passed his physical. They give me my plane ticket, send me to the airport. And I was – when they told me that I was not the guy, I was more relieved than I was disappointed. And that was my sign. I'm like, it's time. Now it's done. Got on a phone call. Wife was like, I'm coming home. I won't be home until tomorrow because I got to connect through, J you know, sticking JFK and then to Dallas and then up and whatever. But, uh, but I'm coming home and I'm done. So, so then I got home and I started kind of trying to figure it out, but it was still a, it was still a challenge. And I did, I did real estate for a little bit 
calling about six, eight months because there was some agricultural real estate. I thought that there was some there was some elements of that that appealed to me. Um, and it didn't wasn't quite the right fit. It wasn't quite what I was looking for. Um, and then and then it's interesting. I talked about with Philip with the spirituality stuff. I mean, I've been I've been thinking about this for a long time. I knew my career was about to end. I probably played three to six years longer than what I thought I was going to play. So I'd been thinking, okay, what am I going to do when I'm done? So I was trying to figure it out, right? Me, I'm going to try to figure this out. I can do it. I can do it. I can just work hard, right? It's like, it was like golf. It's like, I, I'll just swing harder. That'll, that'll, that'll fix it. <laughs> um, and uh, which is not the case. I was sitting there in church after church one day and I just sat down and the real estate thing was, I, I was having some success, but it wasn't, I knew it wasn't what I was wanting to do. And I was just like, all right, God, I, I quit. I'm, I can't do this. I can't do this without you. I'm trying to figure it out and it's not working, obviously. So I will do whatever it is that you need me to do, but I'll, I need to, I'm giving this over to you. It's interesting. Mike Sweeney, the baseball player is a great friend of mine. We were in San Diego together. Our kids went to school together and he has a, an image, actually a sticker that he gave me. Um, and he tells a different story about it, but it's of a two seater bicycle. Right. And the guy in front is pedaling, but he's got the handlebars and the guy in back has got handlebars, but they don't move. And we just pedal. And he's in, uh, and the, in the image with it is like, make sure that you're sitting on the right seat because up to that point, as far as me and career and whatnot, I was like, I'm on the front, I'll pedal, I'm steering, I'm going to figure this out. And that wasn't my place to be i was supposed to be in the back and finally i told god i was like all right i'm getting on the back seat you get on the front you see this thing wherever you want to go i'm just going to pedal as hard as i can and we'll go from there and i got a call from um these guys with the latest um just a random call literally two days later and the rest has been history how has spirituality helped you throughout your entire life not just the process from transitioning from football to post-football life so when we talked earlier about this is not what this is what you do, it's not who you are. And I had to step back and be like, okay, well, okay, if I'm not a quarterback, then what then who am I? And I came I come from a spiritual family. I got an uncle that's a priest, I got a great aunt that's a nun. I mean I, a grandma that basically is probably, you know, as close as I've seen to a saint. But and my wife's family is very spiritual as well. But, you know, there's a there's kind of living it and then there's really, truly buying in and living it and committing to it. And and that was when I started to do that. And and that's it doesn't matter if I get cut like I did in 2011 twice. You know, when people say you're not good enough to be a quarterback anymore um, and or if people say, hey, we're not bringing you back. You're not you're too old to be a quarterback now. Or whatever that might be, it, it, none of that, um, none of that matters because the 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 rock that I choose to live, uh, that I that I chose to to build my identity house, if you will, isn't going anywhere. And that's that's where that that's where that that comes in. And, and to have that base and that foundation is is what carried me through some of the harder times because I could always turn to scripture. I could always turn to my prayer life. I could always turn to the sacraments. I could always do all of that. That got me refocused on, okay, well, why am I really here and what's most important? Um, and um, that was where, you know, a lot of, I think being around Philip and some of the other guys I talked about Sweeney, even John Lynch, um, those guys in San Diego, California um, had, a, had a big impact on taking that, spirituality of my faith to the next level to answer your question it's been the it's been the foundation that i've tried and i have not been perfect but i've tried to live my life that my wife and i have tried to live to base our marriage off of and base our family off of is that foundation of our catholic faith and when you have a foundation like that as well and you know whichever faith you are when you have a certain foundation or spirituality or anything like that it doesn't matter if people say you're not good enough or Oh, you only threw five touchdowns and you threw 12 interceptions. When you have such a solid foundation, you're like, okay, great. And then you just 
you know, and it, don't get me wrong, it's not as easy as just shooing that off. But when you have a great foundation to go back to, people say you stink. It still, it still, it still hurts. Um, um, but it, I, I think that the, you know, the lows don't go as low and they don't last as long. Um, and conversely, the highs don't go as high and they don't last as long either because there's an element of of humility I think that comes with um, with spirituality that is that is certainly very healthy and necessary um, but it, it 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 keeps you grounded and it keeps you consistent um, you know because the let me tell you I've I've seen it I've seen it happen when those highs get too high those can those can be just as detrimental as the lows, as the, the low lows. So, it, you know, that's, that's been, I've been blessed to have that as the foundation that I've tried to stand on as much as possible. I haven't been perfect by any means, but. Hey, none, none, none of us are, man. We all, you know, we all, we all, we all strive to be great each day, but it doesn't mean there's no such thing as, as perfect, you know, um, in, in, in that regard. That was one of the things, Philip Rivers, and if you ever watch one of his um, interviews, he'll have the hat on. Um, he adopted um, uh, this saying, and it ended up being like almost part of team culture, but Newt Chepi, uh, that means now we begin. And it applies to everything, right? It, it applies to us spiritually, right? We, we fall down, we fail. What, okay, we pick ourselves up. We don't quit. We pick ourselves up and we go again. You know, we throw a pick. Doesn't matter. Now we begin. We begin to get throw a touchdown. Doesn't matter. We begin. We go again. We're just trying to put one foot in front of the other in every aspect of our life and trying to be better than we were before. It was cool stuff. I've got the couple hats that he's sent me, and um, um, it's uh, it's always fun to share that with people. See that, and, th- and those are the types of things that myself and, and listeners are going to love because those are, you know, we know like you, you you play on Sundays, you play on Mondays, maybe you play on Thursdays. We see just the outside view, but we don't get like the inner workings of the relationships with your teammates, like guys like Philip Rivers, you know, and and the intricacies the intricacies of, of that. That to me, that's the best part, Kellen. I don't want to lose sight of. Um, what you're doing now. And you, you touched on, obviously, that you're working over at Alatus. You're the VP of Sales uh, and Sports Development. Can you kind of explain to everybody what what you do over at Alatus and, 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 and their process? Yeah, so the, the high level, it, it's been a heck of a ride. We're the exclusive provider of Prism Brain Mapping, which is the most comprehensive um, behavior assessment tool in the world it is I mean, i've taken quite a few over the years with different things and it's absolutely mind-blowing which is why i wanted to get involved when they first um approached me about it um and on a high level view what we do is we help at a latest we help um companies recruit build and develop right so in the recruiting side if you think about your behaviors think more so what you do as opposed to kind of um like different personality tests that you see out there, the DISC, the Myers-Briggs and stuff. And there's benefit to all of it. Um, It's just that what we do, what we have with PRISM goes to a whole different level. If we were um, working with a company like, um, I'm going to pull one out, let's say Amazon, just for the heck, just for heck of it. Um, And Amazon said, well, we're going to hire, we're looking to hire these, you know, a thousand, two thousand people in this role. What we can do is we can take their, um, top 10, 20, 30, whatever high performers that are currently in that role. And what we do is we measure on 22 different measurables, the DNA and create a success profile, if you will. So you have basically an all-star profile of what it is that you're comparing these different candidates to. Um, Because what studies have shown is that if you are fulfilled in your job role, then you are uh, significantly more likely to, you're gonna have, you are going to have higher out, higher quality output, you're gonna stay with the company longer, you're going to be more fulfilled, everybody wins. The cool part about it is, is it's completely data-driven. There's no, it doesn't matter if you're tall, short, white, black, right-handed, left-handed, man, woman, does not matter. None of that shows up in the screening process, so it's completely diversity neutral, which is, which is huge and I think very impactful to get people just into the interview. 
So we're doing that. We also have um, team building um, exercises on the build part, virtual team building, team analysis, team diagnostics. Um, and then on the development side, uh, there's also all sorts of, you can do the same thing with um, succession planning for an individual when you want to bring them in. Okay, well, what path as you climb the ladder and Amazon is going to give you the most fulfillment. And there's stories of people that I've talked to doing their debriefs um, of guys that have been promoted and have been miserable because their their profile didn't fit the uh, the job role that they got promoted into. And so, you know, the company was scrambling, trying to, okay, well, how are we going to move people back? We've now spent six months training this person with a new role. And anyway, it, there's, there are messes that could be completely avoided and a greater efficiency to the process. I got brought in, not because of my extensive HR background. <laughs> I got brought in because I've known, I knew one of the partners and I'm like, hey, is there, do you think that there's an, an application here possibly in sports? I don't know. I wasn't doing any much at the time. I said, let me take the test. So I went through and I looked at it. And among some of the other things that you're talk that it measures for are uh, mental toughness and emotional intelligence, critical for an athlete on eight uh, different dimensions. So not just you are mentally tough, but on eight different dimensions for emotional intelligence and mental toughness. So what I've done is then created because the outputs that come from Prism are so extensive that a coach isn't going to want to, they're not going to have time to use to look at a 40 page report. They're just not. So, what I've done is I've taken the outputs from Prism and created a one page document for you, the coach, okay, that says, okay, here are, here's the way to uh, engage, teach, and motivate your athlete based on their personal preferences. What are their preferences and how they want to be coached? Because my belief is, and I think it's absolutely correct, is that you can't coach every athlete the same. I'm not going to coach Jimmy the same way that I coach Tommy, the same way that I coach Sarah, and the same way that I coach Jill. I'm not going to do it because they're different. We're all different, and we deserve to be coached differently. Now, in a team setting, that's one thing, but on an individual level, we need to be coached differently. So we're given the keys to a coach to understand right now Here's how I want to coach this athlete. Uh, here's how you want to coach this athlete to maximize that athlete on the field. Good. Here's some insights to emotional intelligence and mental toughness of where you can work with them to grow them and, in, and improve them spe in specific areas. Instead of just saying, I mean, you played hockey. Instead of saying, hey, today we're all taking shots from the blue line. Okay, well, that's great. But you might have some guys that need to take some shots from left corner. You might have some guys that need to be goalies. You might have to whatever. We need to reach guys and girls where they are, right? We need to do that. That's awesome. And that we've gotten incredible feedback from both professional and college um, sports teams. The cool part about this on the – we talked earlier about, okay, you knew exactly that you wanted to be a sports broadcaster when you went to Arizona State. A lot of times as athletes, we're not sure. And we don't have – you know this. We don't have the opportunity because of our commitment to sports – we're full-time students and we're full-time athletes while we're on campus. We don't have the opportunity to do the internships, the job shadows, the did to try to figure out what is it that I what is it that I'm really trying to what is it that I want to do? What is this going to give me fulfillment when I'm done? Because 98% of us aren't going pro after college. We're not. That's what the numbers are, right? And that's gonna Troy Palomalo is gonna poor Troy is getting hey, poor guy, he's like the real world in this thing. But Troy Palomalo is gonna sneak up and smack us in the teeth, right? So what, as an additional output, coach gets their one pager. As an additional output, academic and career advisor at the college level specifically get what we call a career explorer report, which highlights for them that athlete's preferences in eight different dimensions, the behaviors and the degree to which they prefer to use those behaviors so that they can help them. Look, this is what is going to give you. They can guide them, counsel them in a way to set that athlete up for internships, micro internships, job shadows, et cetera, networking events in ways that are going to more rapidly lead to a career of fulfillment. I saw too many athletes that went from, that showed up with all these high accolades and they didn't mesh with the coach, the coach, you know, it didn't gel or just didn't click or whatever it might've been. And then you know, watch them after three or four years, what you thought was going to be a promising career doesn't end up happening. Worst case scenario for that team is athlete transfers and flourishes someplace else. 
because we can reach him, right? Which I'm trying to help the athlete with that. But the reality is the numbers still are what they are. And there's still only so many spots at the table. There's still only so many seats at the table. So we still have to prepare. And that's the part for me that I think is going to be, is have the greatest lasting impact. Because, I mean, you and I talked about it before. These athletes, if uh, you know, if, if they live a long and healthy life, which we all hope for, have 60 to 70% of their life still waiting for them when they're done. That's what's most important. So to be able to set them up for that part of their life and the greatest degree of fulfillment uh, and happiness, that's the part, that's the part that I'm that really gets me excited about. That yes, get better on the field or on the court or whatever, and be able to connect with a coach or a coach connect with an athlete quickly. But to be able to help these athletes, especially at the college level, even at the pro level, I wish I would have had this when I was coming out. <laughs> I would have maybe had that same spiritual uh, epiphany. So maybe <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have. But um, but I wish I would have had it coming out of the pros too as well. And it's going to be available for them. But that's what we're doing. I think it's going to be really impactful um, both on the field and off. Um, but I think it can have a really positive impact on some athletes' lives for a really long time and that that's what i'm doing that's why i get so excited um about what we're doing the best part kellen is just seeing how jacked up you get you know about about what you're doing now it, it, in some ways i feel like you've been more excited to talk about this than your career in in the nfl man you know it, it's i did the real estate thing and it was kind of like it was the first time it was one of the first times in my life that i went to work i'll never forget dave mcginnis uh, was a coach when I was with the Rams. And I'm like, Dave, you coming into work today? He goes, Pfft. I've been coaching football for, I don't know, it was like 40 years or something at that point. He's like, I haven't worked a day in my life. And, uh, and, and, I, and I, I realized kind of later what he meant when he said it. And because, you know, it's, you want to find something that you're passionate about and that, that, that fills that cup. And I, I mean, I, I made a little bit of money doing the real estate thing. It wasn't about, I can't make a living. Um, cause I could see the potential for that, but it wasn't, I wasn't fulfilled in what I was doing. Um, and, and I found that with Elatus and I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I'm excited to be able to help other athletes. It doesn't have to be athletes, but athletes primarily, um, find that same amount of fulfillment just to understand our behaviors and what, what makes us tick and what, what fulfills us? What gives us joy? What is it that gets us out of bed in the morning? I mean, you get out of bed in the morning, you're like, I get to talk to so and so, you know, I get to talk to Marcus Lattimore, I get to talk to whoever you know else might be on there. I mean, that's exciting. I would imagine because you've you've found out you fit your profile and what the job role is, it fits for you right now. And I've done the same thing, but there's a lot of people that don't, or it takes three and four or five years and two or three different careers to kind of figure it out. Let's shorten that so that we can maximize. And now you got me going so that we can like, and there's a marketability of being a student athlete. There really is. When you go into a job interview, they get, uh, you know, I mean, you understand how to work hard. You should understand how to be on a team. You should understand how to, you know, uh, deal with a certain adversity and da, 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 da. you've been in high pressure situations. Certainly. Okay. Let's make sure it's the right job that we're interviewing so that we don't, you only have so many times to shoot that shot. Let's make sure it's the right job that we're interviewing the first time. And let's shoot. Let's have that in play. Well, the time I'm a sophomore, let me identify that company. Make sure I get, you know, when that CEO gives me his business card, let me make sure that I follow up with a text message in a few weeks. And I circle back and we, you know, I just happen to run into him for coffee. Never violating NCAA regulations. I'm not saying that. But there, there's just, there's a lot of opportunities to, I think, get, um, to be more efficient with the process. And that's why I love what you're doing over at Alatus and in Prism Brain Mapping, because again, you're getting these kids to start thinking about, oh, like instead of like their mom or dad saying, I want you to be a lawyer, and maybe that doesn't match up. Then you start, you take the, you, you take the questionnaire or whatever, and it says, Oof, being a lawyer probably wouldn't, wouldn't be your thing. Maybe it's marketing. If you look at, okay, look, you have a, you have a high degree of preference for being innovative and creative and da, 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 da. Look, being, you know, being an accountant 
like your dad. And yes, maybe dad made a good living and, you know, or mom or whoever it was. And, and so you, you saw that and you saw what it provided, but that's not going to bring you happiness, right? Let's understand this is some other directions that you might consider. If nothing else, take this inter internship that is going to see some of these. So you can be, you can do it with a purpose instead of just like, I'm here. I don't know. And it gives you a reason too. I mean, I know there were classes that I walked into. I'm like, I don't even know why I'm here. Those weren't, I didn't do great in those classes. When I walked into actually funny enough, accounting and economics and stuff, I was like, I get this. I understand why I'm here. And those are the classes that I got B's in. When you're dealing with kids in college or maybe a little bit younger, how do you even get them? Cause you still have to, cause they're going to ask you, okay, why am I taking this? And you know, us as adults, we're always, I feel like thinking into the future now, but when you're dealing with someone 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, I feel like they're strictly in, I'm playing football, I'm playing basketball, I'm playing tennis and nothing else matters. So I feel like there's still a little bit of a wall that you have to kind of break down. Yes. There, there is, when you're talking about the career, when you're talking about the career explorer bit, there absolutely is. It's like, I don't, what's the response? I don't need that. I'm going pro. I don't need that. I'm going pro. Well, okay. And, and, and I've talked to, I mean, seven, eight schools already. And it's like, we've told them until they're blue in the face and people don't, they don't want to hear that they're not going pro. Okay. Well, that's fine. Even as me who went pro, played 12 years, I'm still working. I'm mean, still working. Just because you're going pro doesn't mean that you're not going to work. I mean, maybe I don't have 60% of my adult life left where I'm not going to be working. I might have 50%, but I've still got a large amount of my time where I'm going to be working a job. So there's that bit of it. Okay, first, that's fine. Go pro. That's fine. Okay, let's understand that. But the beauty of the way that I've tried to set this up for the college athlete is if you want to go pro, you want this coach to be able to maximize you from day one, right? You want this coach to be able to teach you the way that you want to be taught, not just so that you're some number. You want him to teach you, Colin. He wants to teach you the way that you want to be taught, coach the way that you want to be coached. This is going to give him those insights, right? So he can help you go pro. The Career Explorer Report is a byproduct that is the most impactful long-term, but understanding, and I get it, I'm a realist, because I was 18, the athlete and maybe even the coach may not necessarily care, but there's the other thing too. If I'm the coach and I want to be able to maximize my athletes so that with the new NCAA uh, transfer rules, so they're not transferring after one year and still being able to go play so they don't leave UCLA and go to SC or they don't leave Alabama and go to Auburn or they don't whatever, I want to be able to engage with them right now and start to form that relationship. It's mandatory that you take this. <laughs> <laughs> so there's so there's those two ways. I want I want the kids to take it willingly because I want you to. Um, you want to be open minded I, when you're when you're I taking want the it. open minded when you're taking it. Um, but ultimately, uh, the athlete isn't the one that's writing the check either. So. I'm curious though with with the with the companies, Kellen, and, and I know we chatted about this briefly during the pre-call, because n n nowadays I feel like many companies, or maybe I've had it wrong because I've never been on the hiring side, but they look at your resume, they look at your demo tape, and that's it. So now, like you, you enter in this this brand new process. Um, are companies are they like yes, this is exactly what we needed, or are they still like no, we're just gonna go the old school way. We're gonna look at their resume, see their GPA, and that's it. Well, uh, yes, both end, both end, because it's it's uh, how would I say this? The corporate world doesn't exactly change very fast. Uh, it's not a quick pivot like oh, we'll just do that. So what? But. The reality is Michigan State did a study that if you look at, if you just, you know, traditional hiring, right, resume, job experience, the interview, if you're just hiring on that, you have a 43% chance of having a successful hire, right? When you, in, um, when you include in that the different things that we test for with PRISM on the behavior, so work environment preferences, um, just work preferences, work aptitudes, and the behaviors, you, that the the uh, the percent of making a successful hire goes from forty three to ninety three percent. Those are just stats. 
I mean, I don't know how big you guys are on hockey and stats, but in football, those are, stats are pretty big. And when I know that on from third and six, up to third and six, they're going to blitz 43% of the time. Beyond that, they're going 93% of the time. I'm like, that's a significant increase. I'm, I'm staying the heck out of that. That is the reason why it's like, yeah, this is, this is a legit thing why we're doing it. What we've seen with in the corporate world is cracking the door is the challenge. Once you get in and people experience prism and see it, then the door flings wide open. And now we've got momentum going into 2021 that is very exciting. I'll just say very exciting. Here, here's a here's an, a hypothetical for you. Let's just say you're you're hiring, you're an accounting firm, you're hiring me. You see my resume. Wow, love Colin's resume. You check with my references. They say great things. But then I take, then I take the assessment, and let's just yep. say none of that checks out. Then, then what do you do? Well, that's up to the accounting firm. We're providing the information. Um, for, okay, understanding this individual's, uh, if if your resume checks out, if you have worked at an accounting firm before and you're applying to another one, there's a pretty good chance that you have some of the characteristics of the, the general behavioral profile of an accountant. So it's going to check that. But when you start talking about work environment preferences and different scenarios, when you start comparing, okay, uh, Colin's preferred um, uh, work atmosphere and culture com as compared to us here at PricewaterhouseCoopers or whoever it might be, then those are factors when I'm looking at, okay, is he going to thrive here or is, is this maybe not the best fit? It's not that you're not hireable, but are you the best hire for us? Whereas you might be a better hire for somebody else. If you if you end up with the wrong accounting firm, depending on culture and organizational fit, et cetera, there's a decent chance that in a year's time, you're looking for another one. And that doesn't do us any good because now we've invested a lot of time and resources into you. And then we're right back where we started 12 months ago. Does that make sense? That, that makes com complete sense. And I know we kind of joked about this, you know, when we chatted on the pre-call, but I remember you know, you kind of did like a brief assessment of me and you're like, I don't think you'd be like a good, like a good accountant. I'm like, yeah, I would be horrible. You, you, yeah. You, <laughs> and so I'm a, I'm a certified prison practitioner now so that I, so I can, and I, you know, I had to kind of go through the certification process to, to get to that and take the exam. And it was kind of scary because I talked to the guy that was uh, invented prism over in the UK. Um, but having gone through it now and been doing it for seven, eight months, I mean, the conversations that I'm having with people, you and I, and just you hear people say things and you can't, I don't know specifically, but you start to have an idea of like this person has a higher preference for these couple of behaviors. He doesn't really seem to like this. You have a general idea. Now, it's not all data. It's just kind of purely a little bit of a, of a, of a guess speculation. But yeah, I've been doing it at least enough now that I can, I, I don't miss too bad. The one guy on our team has been doing this for 15 years and he is amazing. Now I almost want to chat with him that way if he can, because I, I just find it fascinating though, just during our, our one chat, like, and I didn't, I felt like I didn't divulge like too much, but you're just like, I get the feeling that like, if, if, if we wanted to hire you to work in the back room of an accounting firm, that you probably wouldn't like that. And, and little, little do you know, Kellen, that thought gives me anxiety. But the anxiety that you feel is what PRISM is able to detect. And then, I mean, there's, I could, you have to experience it to fully appreciate it. I've realized that, which is, it's unfair to try, the, just explaining it doesn't do it justice, but we can, PRISM shows areas of, okay, this is a behavior that's going to cause this person anxiety. This is a certain behavior that's going to cause someone that stress that you probably don't get and I, I don't get, but that some people get when it's like, we need you to speak to the board today, or we need you to speak at your child's assembly, or we need, and they go, oh. And, you know, and they, you know, they make the mistake that, you know, they tell them on a, on Monday and the assembly isn't until, or the engagement isn't until Friday night. And that person doesn't sleep. It's, you know, until that time. So like, I, I don't want to, you know, this whole picturing people in their underwear thing doesn't really work. Um, you know, it just makes it even worse. But, um, 
that was not a great lead time joke. But anyway, um, but that's exactly what Prism is able to, that same anxiety or that same stress or the frustration, right? For you, if I was like, we're going to put you in the back room and Tommy is going to be out smoozing with the, the customers or the people, you'd be like, wait a minute, I, I can do that. I want to do that. So you come home and you're like, yeah, you know, I, you know wife, spouse, whoever says, hey, how was work today? It's like, I, I'm so frustrated. You're not staying at that job. We have the ability to bring all of that to the service and completely data-driven information that is just that is diverse uh, you know diversity neutral and and bring it to the surface so someone can be just like this is a good fit or it isn't based on this person's preferences to do this their behavioral profile so you hire the right people because think about it, if you're in a job that you like even if you don't have as much experience as tom that also applied if you match, I will guarantee you, you are going to learn it faster and deliver over the long term, and it's probably the short term, you're going to deliver better results than Tom. who's like, yeah, I've been doing this for 12 years, and I'm pretty good at it, but I mean, it's not even close. It's not even going to be close. And that's the thing. I think companies, companies, universities, coaches, um, student athletes, people need to stop being so traditional because I mean, I, I love the data stuff. I mean, I was chatting with with um, Kerry Carter. He played at Stanford and he's doing stuff. Um, it's called Adivis. It's like a tackling analytics firm. And, you know, like it, it's again and, and something else that, that's data driven. And I, I think it's so important, especially when it comes to your career and and having a passion, because like you said, you only get one shot, man. You only get one shot. And when you start over, it's like, Ugh. and you can only do this, which. But and here's the cool part, especially in the HR world and the talent acquisition world, there isn't data, there isn't numbers, there isn't you know it's there there isn't as much of that, and we're we're able to give numerical values on the eight different dimensions on the work environment uh, preferences on your um, on the work aptitudes on mental toughness on emotional intelligence, our team building stuff that we've done now for six different companies is unreal the feedback that we've gotten from it and the impact that it's had it's been unbelievable and it's just because it's based off of everything that we're talking about understanding if i can understand you and what makes you click in the same way that the coach would want to understand the players i need to understand my coworkers. and if i can understand where you're coming from when you say x y and z so i don't hear abc and we do this for the next three weeks that's better for everybody everybody wins i just think tons of tons of companies and people just have it backwards because it becomes let's just say we're talking tv okay how does this person look how does this person sound okay this person worked in market 202 butte montana then they worked in nashville then they worked in seattle they take this very traditional chronological very robot approach and it's like well wait a second you're that doesn't mean that that person is going to be the best candidate for that particular job. 100%. And and what we found too, like in our little, even in our team at Alatus, what we found is, I mean, we're, we're practicing what we preach because like there are guys like, for example, yourself being fairly highly innovative, right? We have another guy on the team who's a big time innovator. I'm not. So if you tell me to just like, hey, I want you to go create something, I'm like, oh my gosh. And I can do it. It's not, you can or you can't. It's do you enjoy it? Do you prefer to do it? How much do you prefer to employ that behavior? You know, and it's not right, wrong, or indifferent. But we've what we've realized is okay, I can I can do it. It'll take me three weeks to do this tiny little PowerPoint presentation that you want me to do. Or I can send it to my buddy who's a high green and be like, hey, can you help me out with this? And it's done in three hours because he enjoys it. It's like the work that I, I can give you, you know, I I, if you didn't like data, and I don't know because we haven't gotten there yet, but if you didn't like crunching numbers, I can give you the spreadsheet and be like, I mean, you can do it, but it may not be the highest quality work and it's not going to be done efficiently. You give me a spreadsheet and I'm a kid on Christmas. I'm like, oh my gosh, let's put in some formulas. Um, and But but it, and that's the difference but to move a project around a team, especially if 
you know, four to eight, nine, ten people efficiently, everybody wins and it works. And I know because I'm living it. It's incredible. First of all, I'm going to hire you for any sort of Google or spreadsheet stuff. You're, you're my guy now because I, I do not. I mean, d- d- data entry, like I love statistics and numbers, but there, there's a line. There's a line in the sand and, and I do not cross that line. The beautiful thing about Prism is that we can differentiate between those two. Those aren't those aren't the same behavior that you just talked about. And we can because some people like it. I like putting it in. I like doing it. I like running it. And some people like looking at it. Some people like doing both. But it doesn't it doesn't make sense for me to give you all this information. Be like update this spreadsheet, do all this stuff. And it's like, oh my gosh. I mean, that's you're the guy in that situation that works for 15 minutes. Is like, I'm gonna go get coffee. And goes back and works for another 15 minutes. Is like. I'm going to take the dog for a walk and then works with it. It's not, I'm going to sit down. If it's an hour worth of work, you're going to do it over the course of two and a half, three hours. And it's not because you don't like to work. It's like, I'm looking for anything to get me away from this that I don't enjoy doing. I'm going to do that hours worth of work in 30 minutes because I love it. I'm going to wake up early and I'm going to do it. Anyway, sorry, I get a little bit, but that's the difference of it. And on the flip side, you give me three hours worth of creativity on, you know, trying to come up with a concept, a new concept for what we want to do for this pop- podcast. I'm like, I, I have no idea. I put it on your desk. You're like, let's do, um, hey, man, where'd you go? Let's do that. I mean, come up with it like that. It's just, it, it comes because you enjoy that. It is, um, it is amazing, though, because I've seen, like, I think back to, like, certain points in my career when I was a sports anchor reporter. I rarely, like... I would just, I hated getting up from my desk because it's like, I'm like writing, crafting this like comedic script or something. And it's just like, you're so like entrenched and glued. And next thing you know, you have your mom's best friend who's crazy saying, why aren't you eating dinner? I'm like, you don't understand. Like, I love what I do. And then on the flip side, something you don't like, it's like, oof, you know what? I got to get my car washed. I have to get my oil changed. And I'm not that responsible of a guy. (laughs) hundred <laughs> percent you asked me to write that comedic strip because i'm super low on inv- innovating i'd be like i uh, i mean okay you're gonna get something that's gonna be somewhere between stinking die hard and winnie the pooh and but, they, but not very but not even close to good riddled with grammatical errors because i don't want to do that i don't want to do it after chatting with you and and hearing your excitement and obviously i mean you you have my curiosity and in some respects don't get me wrong i've thoroughly enjoyed discussing the early days you know in burns and kind of taking you through your football career but man this is so cool it's fascinating stuff it's fascinating stuff i love it i'm excited it fits for me from a behavioral standpoint i'm excited about it and if you had to go back in time let's let, let, let's put a year on it 18-year-old Kellen, you get to go back in time. You get to talk to him for five minutes and to impart some knowledge. What would you say? Slow down. Slow down and enjoy the process. I was a guy that was always so driven. It was like, what's next? What's next? What's next? What's next? I didn't stop and smell the roses, as they say. Um, And that that would be the thing that I wish I would have done is just taking some time to just, this is, this is pretty cool. You know, and just and enjoy the ride a little bit more. That's some very sound advice. I think many of us, including I'm kind of like you, I'm always running, 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 going, 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 going. And very rarely, you know, then two years after something great happens, I'm like, oh, that was pretty cool. Kellen, I appreciate you taking the time and we, we discussed a lot. Again, thank you for the time. And um, I really enjoyed the conversation. Again, it's, it's those tiny moments that, that we don't get to see as sports fans. Um, and obviously what you're doing now, uh, it, it's, it's cool. It's great. And um, where can people check out uh, what you guys are doing at Alatus? Alatus.com. Actually, it's, uh, you can see everything you need right there. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's good stuff.